Hey everyone, welcome to the March issue of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu. This month, we're looking at another outstanding issue from emergency medicine practice provided to us by Dr. Brian Geyer. The topic is acute gastroenteritis, and there are many, many pearls in this issue as usual. Dr. Geyer has provided us with reviews of current literature in addition to the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, the American College of Gastroenterology guidelines, and the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines. And who knew that there was this much to talk about when it came to vomiting and diarrhea? I mean, it's a common complaint, and we see it in the emergency department all the time, but 178 million cases a year in the United States alone, and almost half a million hospitalizations and 5,000 deaths a year? I had no idea. And you know what else I didn't know is the actual definition of gastroenteritis, which according to the American College of Gastroenterology, is more than one episode of vomiting and at least three episodes of diarrhea in 24 hours without any history of inflammatory bowel disease or other chronic causes. And symptoms have to be ongoing for less than 14 days to be considered acute. And after 14 days, they're really just considered persistent and it's not considered chronic diarrhea until 29 days. That's a lot of diarrhea. Now, something you'll notice as we're talking today, many of the recommendations that come from these specialty societies are actually derived from literature used in pediatrics. There actually isn't that much published in the adult literature about acute gastroenteritis, which is surprising considering how many cases there are annually. But nevertheless, I digress. Let's talk about some causes. Part 1. Causes. Viruses, viruses, viruses. The vast majority of cases are caused by them. 70% in fact. And of those, the norovirus is the prime culprit with rotavirus in second place. Now there are some bacterial causes, but this is less than 6% of cases. We're talking about things like salmonella and clostridium and campylobacter and less than 3% of the cases are parasitic. So the vast majority are going to be viruses. And that's going to be the reason why over 50% of the people we see in the emergency department never actually have a cause identified for their symptoms because we don't have a way to detect most of these in testing in the emergency department. And outside the ED, that's in the outpatient setting, up to 80% of these things don't get a formal causative agent identified. In fact, even if you manage to get a stool sample from the patient and send it for testing, you still only identify a causative agent in about 50%. And here's another little fact I found interesting. Food poisoning, that's from toxins or the direct bacterial effect, is responsible for only 5% of acute gastroenteritis cases that we see in the emergency department, but 30% of the deaths that we see every year. And the most common agents there are salmonella, clostridium, and campylobacter. But even food poisoning is usually viral. That norovirus rears its ugly head again. It actually makes up the majority of food poisoning cases as well. And then lastly, there's E. coli. Now, E. coli is normal in the gut, but the two most common causes of gastroenteritis in the E. coli family are shigatoxin E. coli, or what we used to call enterohemorrhagic E. coli, and enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is the organism that's responsible for traveler's diarrhea. And both of these cause self-limited illness. Part 2. Differential Diagnosis Now, when we're talking about gastroenteritis or vomiting and diarrhea in general, it's important to keep a wide differential turns out that appendicitis is likely at the top of that differential. In the pediatric literature, misdiagnosis of appendicitis as acute gastroenteritis leads to about 47% absolute increased risk of appendiceal perforation. And there are some suggestive historical and physical exam findings that should make you consider appendicitis a little bit more. Things like migration of the pain to the right lower quadrant of the abdomen, or right lower quadrant tenderness on exam, either initially or even on repeat examination. The absence of diarrhea is another one. 
So if there's just vomiting and abdominal pain, move appendicitis up on your differential. Also, if pain is not improved with episodes of diarrhea, you should move appendicitis up on your differential. Now, there are a couple of negative factors that are important as well. For example, if there are multiple family members who are ill with the same symptoms, if there's been recent international travel, and if there is the presence of diarrhea. All three of these factors have been shown to be negative factors for appendicitis. There are a couple of other conditions that are also important to keep in mind. One is ciguatera fish poisoning. Now, this is a toxin that's produced by algae that's consumed by reef fish, like grouper, red snapper, sea bass, and Spanish mackerel. And those symptoms usually start pretty quickly, within 6 to 24 hours after ingestion of a fish that tastes normal. And the patients develop some unusual symptoms. Sometimes they're neurological, things like paresthesias, uh, generalized itching, uh, and reversal of that hot, cold sensation. And typically, these symptoms resolve spontaneously. Uh, there is some mention in the literature of treatment with mannitol, but that's controversial. Another condition is scombroid poisoning. Now, this is ingesting a fish in the scombroidae family, like mackerel, bonito, albacore, and skipjack, fish that have been stored improperly. Now, the bacteria within the gut of the fish produce a histidine decarboxylase, which is an enzyme that converts histidine to histamine. And when ingested, it causes abdominal cramps and diarrhea, and this metallic, bitter, or peppery taste in the mouth, and sometimes facial flushing within about 20 to 30 minutes of ingestion. And because of that, it's often confused for an allergic reaction. But the symptoms go away in six to eight hours, and depending on where you're working, it often requires notification of the health department to, to try and prevent an outbreak. If you're a subscriber, I highly encourage you to take a look at the table on page five of the issue, labeled Distinguishing Factors in the Differential Diagnosis of Acute Gastroenteritis. It is excellent and will run through all of these different causative agents and some of the common symptoms and pitfalls. Part 3, History and Physical. When it comes to obtaining a history from the patient, there are the common questions that we're going to ask, like onset, timing, number of stools, is there blood in the stool, is the patient having fever, uh, and then questions regarding abdominal pain and the character and the quality of the pain and whether or not the patient's been on any recent antibiotics so that we can consider Clostridium difficile or C. diff in the differential. But also we want to note things like the person's age. Are they at the extremes of age, so less than three months or over 65 years? Uh, are they on any immunosuppressants or do they have any autoimmune conditions that we should know about? Uh, and is the person pregnant? Because these are the populations that are at the highest risk. And when it comes to the physical exam, there aren't all that many things to note other than the location of the pain and the type of discomfort they have or tenderness on examination. But there is one interesting tidbit in this issue I want to bring to light, and that's the study of 889 adults and 151 pediatric patients with acute gastroenteritis that showed that a negative fecal occult test accurately excluded invasive bacteria as an etiology with a negative predictive value of 87% in adults and 96% in children, which I find very interesting. Now, the positive predictive value, that is, if they actually had blood in their stool, was not as good. That's 24%. But as a rule-out test, it performed quite well. Part 4. Labs and Imaging Dehydration is the biggest contributor to mortality, especially in the extremes of age I mentioned earlier, the very young and the elderly. So laboratory evaluation is really aimed at identifying severe dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities in these populations. There is no consistent association between any specific lab abnormality and a bacterial etiology. So the white blood cell count and the differential does not help you differentiate between bacterial and viral illness, but it can help identify severity of illness. And hemoglobin and platelets are helpful if you're considering hemolytic uremic syndrome because of the E. coli species. Stool cultures are an interesting topic. 
There are some guidelines. The Infectious Disease Society of America recommends getting them in patients who have fever, uh, bloody or mucoid stools, severe abdominal cramping or tenderness, and signs of sepsis. Their rationale is that these are the patients that are at higher risk of bacterial infection, specifically Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, and Yersinia. Part 5. Treatment. Treating gastroenteritis falls into one of two categories. There's hydration, and then there's medication. Oral hydration is really the preferred method. So getting a patient, especially a pediatric patient, to hydrate orally is the best way to treat gastroenteritis. And there are lots of options. There are oral rehydration packets. There are commercial products, things like Pedialyte and Hydrolyte. There are even sports drinks that can be used. The only caution about sports drinks is that they can be quite sugary, so sometimes you do have to dilute them with 50% water. There's even coconut water that is high in electrolytes. And there's one study that showed that half-strength apple juice works very well in decreasing treatment failures in pediatrics. Obviously, there's IV hydration, and this is reserved for patients who have severe dehydration, like those who are unable to tolerate oral liquids, uh, those who present with hypovolemic shock or septic shock, or those who have failed an attempt at oral rehydration. And in these cases, we also want to remember to replace electrolytes specifically potassium and magnesium. When it comes to nausea, there are several options. Ondansetron, or trade name Zofran, reduces the need for IV hydration in pediatrics when given orally. It doesn't reduce hospitalizations or return visits, but those are generally extremely small numbers. There is no benefit to higher dose ondansetron, and IV ondansetron and metoclopramide perform similarly in pediatrics. A few other medications that have been studied include dexamethasone, which has not been shown to be helpful, and dimenhydrinate, or trade name Dramamine, which has also not shown to be helpful. Prochlorperazine, 10 mg IV, was shown to be actually superior than promethazine, 25 mg IV, for symptomatic relief in adults and results in less sedation. But Specifically, there are no guidelines about which medication should be used when, so you've got a lot of room here for personal preference. Interestingly, there was a study regarding isopropyl alcohol-soaked pads. So these are little rubbing alcohol pads that they had the patients sniff every two minutes in order to reduce nausea. And what they found was that the effect was superior to placebo in controlling nausea, but that it left in about 30 minutes or so. So this is an interesting pearl to keep in your back pocket while the patient's waiting to get IV access or other therapeutic measures, and isopropyl alcohol pads are readily available just about anywhere in the emergency department. Also, ginger is often used, especially in the pregnant population, to try and reduce nausea, but it's given orally at a dose of 250 milligrams four times a day and has also been studied in postoperative patients. There's no data for use of ginger in acute gastroenteritis, but something else to consider. When treating diarrhea, loperamide is usually what most people reach for. And it is recommended by the American College of Gastroenterology as an adjunct to antibiotics, but they do note that the risk is too high in patients less than three years old, and in the age group of three to 12 years old with moderate dehydration, bloody stool, or severe disease. Outside of those exclusions, they do recommend its use. However, it's important to keep in mind that loperamide is contraindicated in the shiga toxin-producing E. coli infections because there is an increased association of hemolytic uremic syndrome in patients who have that infection and receive loperamide. There are also several studies on probiotics in the pediatric population that show perhaps a benefit of reducing diarrhea by a day. And lastly, the World Health Organization recommends zinc supplementation for children with diarrhea. In the U.S., that's really only recommended to reduce duration in severely malnourished children in the age group of six months to five years, but something else to keep in mind. Antibiotics. Okay, so here's where the rubber meets the road. 
who gets antibiotics and who is told this is a virus and it's self-limited and go home. Patients with traveler's diarrhea who are coming to the emergency department after traveling to Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa actually do improve faster with antibiotic therapy. If you look at the publication, there are all kinds of antibiotic recommendations ranging from azithromycin to Cipro. But patients with traveler's diarrhea from South Asia or Southeast Asia actually have an increased risk of being infected with strains that are resistant to fluoroquinolones, like Campylobacter. And so the antibiotic regimen recommended changes a little bit. There is an outstanding chart on page 12 with detailed antibiotic recommendations based on each one of these organisms. If the patient has ingested shellfish recently, then doxycycline becomes first-line therapy. And if you're considering C. diff in the differential and you're interested in treating it, then it's important to keep in mind that metronidazole is no longer the first-line agent of choice. It is oral vancomycin for all patients. We used to reserve vancomycin for hospital-acquired patients or patients who were being hospitalized because of severe disease, but the American College of Gastroenterology and the Infectious Disease Society of America changed those guidelines a couple of years ago to reflect the increasing amount of metronidazole resistance in community-acquired C. diff. And so first-line therapy is now vancomycin at 125 milligrams orally four times a day for 10 days. And this is a good time to spend just a second talking about hemolytic uremic syndrome. Now, I mentioned earlier that shigatoxin-producing E. coli can produce bad vomiting and diarrhea and sometimes bloody stools and abdominal cramping, and that treatment with antibiotics in this particular infection can cause hemolytic uremic syndrome. If you're unfamiliar with the condition, I do recommend you go and read a little bit about it, but it's a blood disorder, and it's characterized by low red blood cells, failure of the kidneys, and low platelets. And although it's more common in children, it can affect adults, and there is an association between antibiotic use and a higher chance of developing hemolytic uremic syndrome. The overall prognosis is good, but patients often end up with some persistent kidney disease, uh, and there is a mortality associated with severe cases, so it's not a completely benign condition. So when you're assessing patients and trying to determine who you're going to treat with antibiotics, the publication actually makes a couple of interesting points. First, the number of cases that are attributable to shigatoxin are relatively small unless there's a known outbreak in the community. Second, it is typically a foodborne pathogen, and that's usually the route of contamination, so it's more of a food toxicity presentation than it is the slow, indolent, gradual onset of symptoms we see with some of the other viral infections. And lastly, if there's a question about whether or not to treat, the author here actually recommends treating the patient with antibiotics and sending the stool for shigatoxin testing and then calling the patient back and having them discontinue the antibiotics if it comes back positive. And also, he makes a specific point of saying if you're going to admit the patient because of severe disease to go ahead and start the prophylactic antibiotics while you wait for test results. Part 6. Special Populations we mentioned earlier that immunocompromised patients and those with extremes of age are at increased risk. So less than three months of age or over 65 years of age or have a history of HIV, AIDS, or any other immunocompromised state, these are the patients that are going to require a little more of an extended workup and are going to be the patients who don't just simply receive oral rehydration and then are discharged home. We're more likely to treat them with antibiotics more liberal use of antibiotics is recommended because of the higher risk of cryptosporidium. There's also the risk of cyclospora, cystiospora, and microsporidia and mycobacterium avium complex, but those are the types of organisms we're looking at in this population. Interestingly, the Infectious Disease Society of America recommends antibiotic therapy in immunocompromised patients and avoidance of probiotic use because of the lack of evidence. 
and if they have profuse watery diarrhea, it's safe to use loperamide in this population. Another interesting tidbit is the population of patients who are on a proton pump inhibitor or a H2 blocker. There is increasing evidence that these medications increase the susceptibility to viral and bacterial pathogens, and so suspending the medications in patients with acute gastroenteritis is a reasonable recommendation until the symptoms have improved. And lastly, it's important to know that there is an entity called post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome, which really just results in persistent abdominal pain and diarrhea after an episode of acute gastroenteritis. This doesn't really reflect a treatment failure as much as it reflects persistent irritation after the infection. And management is just supportive. Disposition. How do we decide when it's okay to send somebody home? Well, if their vital signs have improved after hydration and they're tolerating oral liquids, that patient is likely to be able to go home, remembering that we should be treating electrolyte abnormalities if we happen to measure them. And if they're in the higher risk category that we discussed, like the immunocompromised or the extremes of age, they should be considered for admission until they have demonstrated some kind of clinical improvement. And that's it for the March issue of Amplify. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Again, I highly encourage you to log on to ebmedicine.net and take a look at the full publication. There are so many resources in the issue itself and in the appendix. Just too many things to cover today, but a very, very thorough review of all things gastroenteritis. Until next time, I'm your host, Sam Eshoo.